Good morning. Uh, my name is Erica Nelson, and I'm very happy to have you all here for part two of the Humanitarian Spatial Technologies webinar series. I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your doom scrolling or <laughs> productive or non-productive things that we're all doing to try to distract ourselves in this ambiguous moment. Uh, I hope all of you or some of you were around last week to take part in the webinar around the decolonialization of data. And if not, uh, it will be archived and put on YouTube with the link coming to you soon. Today, we're going to be pivoting to look at critical cartography, the subjectivity, politics, and power of spatial data. Next slide. So a little bit about me. Um, my name is Erica Nelson. I am the co-director of the Humanitarian Geoanalytics Program at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. By night, <laughs> quite literally, because I'm a nocturnist, I am an emergency medicine physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital and I'm faculty at the Harvard Medical School. Over, I'd say the predominance of the last decade, I've been deeply engaged in research around the use of spatial analytics for humanitarian programming and the incorporation of critical geography and user-centered design within that. My Twitter handle is at the bottom, as is my email address and will be amplified again through the uh, YouTube chat if you want to get in touch with me, or if you want to retweet uh, this, this webinar, this is an ongoing conversation and something that really needs to be amplified in our mutual communities. I also just want to put out there that I am not an expert in critical geography, and uh, I am very much happy to have other opinions, conversations, questions, uh, dissent, and hopefully we can parse through some of that during this webinar, through that YouTube chat, and I will be addressing some of your questions and those thoughts during this time. Next slide. So I want to start off this webinar with a quote from John Rennie Short that I think really captures what we're trying to discuss today. He says that maps are neither mirrors of nature nor neutral transmitters of universal truths. They are narratives with a purpose, stories with an agenda. They contain silences as well as articulations, secrets as well as knowledge, lies as well as truth. Now, the reason why this is so important is because maps have derived a lot of power from the fact that populations that view them and use them for whether it be funding or conceptualizations of reality or programmatic design often take them to be uh, a representation, a positivistic representation of mathematical and geographic truth. I mean, this is kind of anecdotally and humorously uh, metaphorized, if that's a word, by back in the day when Google Maps and Waze and those sorts of Wayfinder applications came to the fore and people would use them in order to get where they're going and they would rely on them so much that despite what they saw through their windshield, sometimes they would drive off the road or to an alternate destination and uh, unfortunately in some circumstances drive into lakes and off of cliffs. And that power is a tremendous metaphor for how the general population, how our communities view maps. And so we really have to take into account that power and spend a lot of time being critical about what is being portrayed, who's portraying it, and the systems of power, privilege, and oppression that surround the capacity to represent reality. So while you reflect on that, we're gonna to move to the next slide. So this is just a brief layout of what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about how maps are subjective. We'll start off with the nuts and bolts of cartography. We'll talk about scale, projection, and symbolism. These things seem very pedantic uh, in their makeup, but in reality, there are a multitude of decisions that are made that can significantly change the narrative being told. And then we're going to kind of scope out a little bit and think about the subjective cartographer their biases, whether they be explicit or implicit, and then we'll nest that within a bigger conversation around systems of power and privilege. Next slide. So let's start off with scale. Scale seems, like I said, very pedantic, but particularly important when we're trying to communicate distance or area to those viewing maps. 
again, going back anecdotally, when I first visited my brother in Brooklyn, I pulled up my Google Maps and thought to myself, where am I going today? And decided to go to Williamsburg and like this cute little cafe there. And I thought, of course I can walk there. That's no problem. And then I typed in the address and the address as to where I am and it calculated everything. And the 30 minutes that I thought I was gonna be walking turned out to be an hour and a half. And that's because there was no scale on that map. And this is something that we have to think about. We have to think about the scale that we're utilizing in order to communicate distance, whether it be miles or kilometers, or if you're an MIT nerd, then smoots. It has to be a unit of distance that your population, uh, target population understands. Next, next slide, please. Projection. Uh, projection is a much more complicated conversation. Projection is about how do you make something round, like the globe, like the Earth, a flat map. No matter how you slice it, haha, -ha, <laughs> uh, any projection of the globe onto a flat surface is going to distort reality. There are four general characteristics of space, distance, shape, area, and direction. And depending upon which projection you choose or the cartographer chooses for you, it's gonna preserve certain things and then distort certain things necessarily. So a conformal map preserves shape, an equidistance map preserves distance, equal area maps preserve, as stated, area. And so each one of those things has to be taken into account. Next slide. Why does this matter? Well, for a very long time, uh, the Mercator map has been used, I believe it was created in the 1500s, in order to understand directionality as a means of colonialization and imperialism. And it focused on Europe and kind of the greater northern continents in, as a means to, to navigate ships. Now, the Mercator map is a map that will inherently distort size uh, as further away from the equator. And so we're seeing here in this, in this map that I honestly stole from Twitter that the Mercator map significantly uh, misrepresents the area of continents and countries in, on, on our globe. Why does this matter? Well, first off, because spatially intuitively, we as humans equate size with importance. We also equate size with an understanding of our resources. And we also equate northernmost things with more important things in comparison to southernmost things. And so when we think about, let's say, the real size of our world, Africa is approximately 14 times the size of Greenland, but we're not teaching communities this. The Mercator map has been used internationally for centuries to represent reality. And until recently, we haven't had uh, alternate maps to, to represent, let's say, equal area um representations of the world and so this is actually one of the ways in which we have let's say solidified colonial powers and north-centric practices next slide i would be remiss if i didn't talk about west wing way back in the day uh a little bit longer than i'd like to admit i watched an episode of the west wing in which these highly nerdy cartographers come in. They're the Organization of Cartographers for Social Equality. So, and they postulate the ramifications of using the Mercator map. They talk about how it does kind of reify the global north and, uh, and, and all of the colonial powers. And then they posit this map on the right-hand side of your screen. This is the Gall-Peterson map that has been inverted. And the scripted characters in this show are like, what the, is that? And they said, it's exactly where you've been living. And so they wanted to show that the way that we view our understanding of the world deeply influences how we understand geopolitics. And they just wanted to flip it and make you critique exactly kind of those structures of power and, and representation that exist in our universe. Now, I can't show you the clip for lots of reasons, but I highly recommend you go and check it out. Next slide. 
Before I move on to symbology or symbolism, as it probably should be called, I want to take a pause and see if there are any questions or comments in the universe uh, about what we've been talking about so far. I don't see anything in the chat, so I suppose we will move forward. Okay, so symbolism is a deeply complex component of map making. It's about how do you represent the same data in a way that is understandable, accurate, and biased hypothetically in the way that you want it to be biased. Is it the best representation of your data? And when you're being critical of other people's maps, you should ask this question as well. So here on the right hand side, you're actually seeing two representations of the same data. On the uppermost, you see a dot representation of STI cases in Baltimore in 2015 for census tract. And the size of the dot represents how many cases are there. So the bigger the dot, the better, or the more, the more STI cases you're seeing. On the lower kind of right-hand side, you're seeing the traditional chloroplast map of the same exact thing in which escalating gradations of color show escalating gradations of STI cases. Now, I'm not gonna put it out there for the entire community to ask which is the better representation. I'm just gonna say it. The chloropleth, the chloropleth map makes it more intuitive to understand these spatial patterns. It's much easier to understand that the darker colors are the census tracts in which we see higher STI cases. And so thereby representing something in a visuospatial kind of way, we are able to draw conclusions and create appropriate funding and programmatic interventions. Next slide. Numbers versus rates. So this is us moving on to a, kind of more of a epidemiological understanding of spatial data. The question is, what exactly are you trying to represent? Again, on the far left-hand side, you are seeing a map that just shows STI cases. This is the crude case number per census tract. Now, in the middle is something that is much more uh, normative in the epidemiological world. It is cases per 100,000 people in that census tract. So we're seeing a percentage of the people with STIs. Now, if I'm a, a person who's hoping to create public health programming, the question is, which of these two maps are most appropriate? On the right-hand side, the far right-hand side, is a much more specific denominator. It looks at STI cases per 100,000 female-born persons between 15 and 39. And again, it's showing us a different spatial pattern. Why would we want to use this as our denominator? Well, let's say I'm trying to create programming explicitly for female-born people. This is the appropriate denominator to use. Now, I'm not saying one is correct and one is incorrect. I'm saying that you have to understand the question and the impact that you're trying to make, the associations and conclusions. So I'm going to pause for a second because there's a question. Do you have insights on why the Mercator map has been so consistently and widely used despite clear evidence that it's factually wrong? I understand it's easier to display it in the Mercator format for flat pieces of paper, but even Google Maps only very, very recently changed its UI to reflect the spherical glow. This is a really good question. Why is something that's factually inaccurate being represented worldwide? I'm gonna say, well, number one, it's derived from a system of power and it reinforces a system of power that is North centric and Eurocentric. And the other thing is that all maps are distortions of reality. And so it's very hard for us to make decisions around how we're going to represent that reality when in fact there is no quote unquote empirical truth. Does that make sense for everybody? All right, hopefully. Uh, same person, I wonder what kind of barriers there might be to reflecting the world accurately and why people are so resistant to changing the way we represent it spatially. I think the same answer goes, right? We exist in a space in which our systems and representations of reality reify the current power. It's North centric, it's uh, patriarchal, it's racist, it's socioeconomically biased. And so anything that exists and has been constructed in order to continue that lineage of power is going to be tremendously hard to get over. And similarly, so there's going to be many, many questions about why are we adopting the 
Peter's Gall's map or the Peterson map or any other map when those maps themselves also have a certain degree of bias. They have a certain degree of distortion of the world in which we live. So it's very tricky, but it's also a little obvious sometimes. All right, so let's move on. Uh, next slide, please. Categorization. Okay, so this is, it seems obvious. This is the same representation of STI cases in Baltimore City, but categorization is actually a really crucial decision by the map maker to determine how we're gonna take a contiguous variable and turn it into a categorical variable so that we can display escalating uh, STI cases. On the left-hand side, we're gonna see things by quartile, which shows a lot more STI cases kind of in the Northwest region or the Northern Central region of, of Baltimore City. Whereas if we're looking at equal breaks on the right-hand side, we're seeing far fewer number of high level census tracts. Um, and those are largely just centered in the actual center of Baltimore City. And so as we are making these decisions or as we are interrogating other people's cartographic decisions, we need to think about how the narrative is shaped differently and what is going to happen to subsequent funding and programmatic decisions. Next slide. I would be entirely remiss uh, if we didn't talk about accessibility in the context of symbolism for map making. So approximately one in 12 male born folks are colorblind. That's approximately seven to eight percent of our community. And if we are not understanding how they are going to view our maps, then we are removing them from the conversation. We're removing them or mistelling narratives to that population in a way that is honestly unethical and could lead to kind of incorrect decision making and honestly exclusion. And so there are many options out there in the universe. QGIS has new ways of uh, kind of viewing your map data through different colorblind or grayscale lenses. There are many different uh, options out there like VisualScale and, and some other programs where you can actually apply different colorblind lenses to see exactly how your colors and your representation are being seen by this, by this population. So we have another question. Do you see an over-reliance on color today? Color outputs are interpretive as well. In disasters, for example, a color vulnerability map can become useless if copied in grayscale. This is exactly what we're talking about, right? So yes, we have color printers. We have the internet. We have many different ways to put color into the universe, but we have to understand how that's being utilized. So if I am creating a disaster vulnerability map and it is in a color scale that is not going to be represented when somebody in Uganda prints it out in, in a, a gray format, then it's gonna be useless. And so that's why we do have to understand the community that is going to be utilizing these things, the platforms on which they're going to be utilizing them and then apply the appropriate lenses and decision-making. All right, next. Ha, so this is one of my favorite conversations, talking about lies, damn lies, and spatial statistics. I obviously stole this directly from lies, damn lies, and actual statistics, but the same thing applies, right? So spatial statistics is another world, another set of decisions that helps you portray your data in very uh, statistically rigorous ways, but perhaps creates faulty outcomes depending upon what you're trying to answer. So on the left-hand side of your screen, you are seeing STI cases looking through the lens of a uh, optimized hotspot analysis. So we are seeing in the middle of Baltimore City, these like hotspots of STI cases. We see a couple of places that are statistically kind of cold spots of STI cases. And we're also seeing two of the existent STI clinics that were present during 2015. This was the first proposed way to look at STIs in a way to uh, make decisions about where to put the next STI clinic and to uh, kind of target resources around STIs from a pu public health lens. But then we kind of stepped back for a second and said, what exactly is the most important question for us? 
And so thinking through an understanding of healthcare accessibility, we decided to apply something along the lines of a buffer analysis. So not only did we look at the cases of STIs throughout Baltimore City and that spatial pattern, we decided to say or appropriate basically some of the accepted understandings of accessibility uh, when it comes to healthcare. So if you were within half a mile of walking distance or 200 meters of a bus stop, notwithstanding public transit availability, uh, STI clinic capacity, et cetera, we kind of narrowed it down and just said, hey, if we make this about uh, access, walkability, transit availability, then what does this look like, right? So the, red, the big red census tracts are ones in which we have high STIs, but no accessibility. And as you can kind of tell, that pocket of uh, kind of hot spots of STIs on the Eastern part of, of Baltimore City get obs gets obscured because they have access to the STI clinic. And so the one on the right hand side told a completely different story and told us that we needed to completely reposition where we were going to target our funding and resources. Next slide. Uh, this is a little bit nerdier for those of you out there who uh, know a little bit more about uh, spatial analytics. This is about how you define your spatial parameters in uh, a spatial statistical analysis. And how you define those spatial parameters, like I said, is there's not a right or a wrong answer. It's just how appropriate is it to what you're trying to achieve. So in this context, again, same data. In this one, we're using a local Moran's eye cluster analysis where we look at clusters and outliers of STI prevalence in Baltimore City. And on the left-hand side, we define our spatial parameters as contiguous edges. And so that means that a census tract shares a contiguous edge with its neighbor. And that's how we define kind of nearness between the two of those census tracts. On the right-hand side is a completely different way to define space. We just said, doesn't matter what your boundaries are, doesn't matter if you connect, it's entirely about Euclidean distance in that the closer you are, the more likely you are to impact that. And so further census tracts, whether or not they're touching, have less impact on that spatial analysis. This is inverse distance weighting. All right, so there is another question. We're gonna move on. Should we be completely avoiding the red blue color range to ensure we don't build false narratives into the data based upon color. Color is equal to attention. It's very useful to show what you are looking for. I'm going to pause it. And this is, again, my personal opinion that color is incredibly powerful. And honestly, I, I don't think that we should be completely removing one of these capacities that we have to tell a narrative. I mean, we could talk about red, blue, red, green. Green is considered good, red is considered bad in the North American Eurocentric context, when in fact it could mean exactly the opposite in other contexts. So it really depends on what is the context, who is the audience, what are we going to portray, and then when you're viewing these things, to ask the same questions. Does that make sense? Do we have any other clarification of that question? I don't see anything coming up, but we'll address it as soon as it does come through. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now we are going to scope out as promised to what I would consider the meat of this conversation or uh, the cheese on the broccoli of all of the uh, nuts and bolts that we just talked about to think about the subjective cartographer and systems of power. Now, cartography has been dominated for the last few centuries by an elite few. Like I said, Eurocentric, predominantly male, upper socioeconomic communities. It's been a powerful tool of colonialization and imperialism, but while maps actively construct knowledge and exercise power, they can also be a powerful means to promote social change. So during this time, I wanna re-emphasize the fact that a map only reveals as much as the map maker knows or wants you to know. I also assert that it's tremendously difficult <clears throat> to completely extract the cartographer 
from the systems of power, privilege, and oppression in which they operate, right? So during this next section, we're gonna kind of conflate the two and then try to parse out the different ways in which the cartographer and the system in power, system of power in which they enact kind of interact and allow them, enable them, whatever, potentiate their ability to represent reality. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. So this is exactly what critical cartography is asking us to do. We are kind of encouraged to ask, what is the context of this map? Who made this map? What are they trying to portray? Are they good faith actors, bad faith actors? What are their biases, whether they be implicit or explicit? And again, what are the systems of power that have given them the right or the power in, to, to represent reality in this way? And so not only do we need to ask these questions of ourselves as cartographers, researchers, programmers, uh, but also we need to ask the questions when we are viewing other maps. Uh, next slide, please. So not to be too political, uh, I'm actually just gonna move a little bit into how boundaries have become, how boundaries are essentially a historically robust, tremendously subjective, but in empirically arbitrary way of defining identity and therefore otherness of delineating and reinforcing power. Boundaries are a way of understanding resources and thereby assuming knowledge that determines the extraction or delivery of these resources. I mean, we see this all over the world in this current day. We see it in Crimea and Russia. We see it in Palestine and Israel, India and several of its neighbors. These boundaries are constructed by humans. I mean, let's be honest, predominantly men, and have been created to, uh, they've been critical to sociopolitical and identity conflicts for centuries. The representation of these boundaries has not only become political and a social issue, but also a legal one. In 2016, India proposed a bill, the Geospatial Information Regulation Bill, that among other things would land perpetrators in jail for nearly seven years and cost them $15 million if they incorrectly portrayed national boundaries. Now, it had many other components to this, including uh, complete right over who collected and published geospatial data, uh, everything from satellite data to something that was geo-positioned on your phone. And it was quite the problematic bill. But Actually, Google got in some really deep trouble and Amazon as well got in some really deep trouble because they were portraying very, uh, let's say, controversial boundaries between India and China and India and Pakistan, specifically Jammu and Kashmir, in a way that was uh, considered appropriate based upon the UNHCR and uh, the UN resolution. And so Google kind of came up with a very interesting mechanism by which to address this they started using what we today call agnostic cartography. So instead of drawing straight uh, contiguous boundaries, they started utilizing dashed lines around uh, kind of con conflicted boundaries. Now, depending upon where you're using a map, if it's in China or India, you might see something different, but for many of us outside of that community, we are seeing these dashed lines between the Crimea and Russia, between India and China, between Israel, Palestine, and Syria. And those dash lines, although they may consider, they may be considered to be uh, pandering to different political powers, I think that they're incredibly powerful in that they ask the viewer to take a beat, to pause and to ask, why is this boundary different? And I think that that's an incredibly uh, powerful mechanism to instill in the utilizer of maps, the viewer of maps, to question the empirical, positivistic kind of truth statement of maps. All right, so I'm gonna pause there because there are a few comments and questions coming in. Let's start off with, there's no such thing as getting it right with a map projection. They all have distortion and each projection has different purposes that they are very useful for. Agreed, exactly right. There is no correct answer. Uh, so yes, 100% agree with this person. It really depends upon what question you're trying to answer and what is the most appropriate projection that you're using. 
Let's see, Mercator Maps became popular a long time ago because it was extremely useful for navigation because any straight line drawn on the map represents a route with a constant compass bearing. True, but keeping it around is for political reasons. Fuller projection pretty much eliminates distortion by design. I'm gonna agree with all of that. And thank you for bringing that to the fore. Um, it was utilized explicitly because it was, it maintained and preserved directionality and distance for those populations uh, who wanted to go explore other worlds, colonialize other worlds, appropriate other resources. And so that's why it originated and that's why that decision was made in the 1500s, let me remind you. And the reason why it's kept around is deeply for political reasons. Okay, uh, we're gonna move forward. Thank you uh, everybody for your thoughts. Next uh, slide, please. Ha, okay, so let's really be political if boundaries aren't political enough for you. I'm gonna talk about maps, not only as a mechanism for creating and sharing knowledge power claims, but as a mechanism for maintaining that power. This has actually been a theme as I reflect back on this webinar. Why was it created? Perhaps for one purpose. And then why is it maintained? Because it sustains a power status quo, if you will. Now, gerrymandering, uh, which many people know in this country and is a deeply problematic and political conversation, is about intentionally drawing boundaries to change the partisan makeup of the district. Legislatures have the capacity to redistrict every decade after the census. So uh, this is appropriately uh, important right now because it happened in 2001, it happened in 2011, and so right now we just hypothetically finished our census, so it will happen again in 2021. Now in uh, 2000, in the second congressional district in Utah, after a Democrat won, the Republican legislature, after the census, decided to redraw those legislature districts, uh, legislative districts, in order to favor Republican outcomes. Now, if you can kind of see the, the, the maps up here, the second congressional district went from this little tiny area with like a very high density of people to kind of combining that and, and expanding in this a little like serpentine way such that it includes a very large percentage of the uh, rural Republican community, thereby filtering out or uh, undermining let's say, a lot of the democratic leanings of that district. Now, gerrymandering has been used for decades to undermine minority uh, votes and voices in order to change partisanship of that district. And it's honestly a tremendously problematic and potentially like uh, legally tenuous way to gain and maintain political power. All right, so I've just said a lot of controversial things. I'm gonna pause for a second and see if there's any thoughts right now about how boundaries and redistricting and, and all of these sorts of things um, have changed our reality and how we need to think about them more critically. Nothing at the moment. All right. No comments. So we're gonna move on to our next slide. So this is actually thinking about both the cartographer and the systems of power and oppression in which they exist. Marginalized populations are marginalized mappers or mappers who are marginalized if we're gonna say it in the right way. So approximately two years ago, there was a, a large study to look at who are actually the cartographers in our present space, who are the most predominant ones, who are the ones that are putting maps out that are being utilized. And it turns out only 20 to 33% of cartographers today, two years ago, my apologies, are women. Of the open street maps community, which you would think would be a little bit more inclusive, if you will, um, only two to 5% of those mappers for OSM are women. Now, why does this matter? I mean, it's obvious that 
people who are underrepresented, the things that they care about, things that they need are gonna be under underrepresented in those maps. And so a further uh, research study showed that everything from child hair, childcare resources, uh, healthcare clinics, abortion clinics, things that are important to uh, women and girls, and uh, even in other studies, we've seen LGBTQIA communities are being misrepresented or underrepresented. And so therefore cannot be uh, utilized in order to create programming for some of our most vulnerable communities. Next slide. Huh. Uh, so again, marginalized populations are marginalized mappers. On the left-hand side, I know I'm gonna be tremendously controversial here, but I think it's particularly important. We are seeing a map from the 1940s from the Jewish National Fund that was utilized in order to entice Jews from other countries to come into Israel and to settle it. Now, you can't see it very well because it's relatively small, but it exists on the internet. So I highly recommend that you go and interrogate this map. But what it does is it demonstrates Israeli communities and settlements, but it completely ignores and does not and at all represent Palestinian communities. Now, famously, they use this map and the byline, a land without a people for a people without a land. Talk about a distortion of reality, especially in the 1940s when there were over 600,000 Palestinians in that community. On the right-hand side is kind of the upshot of this. We're seeing a map as designed by the indigenous peoples in North America and how they understand their nations. Not only um, was this project around to assert their land rights, but it also provided communities the ability to catalog the natural resources within each of their territories. And so while we have trouble talking about kind of empowering folks, we really need to understand who has the right to define reality and why is that important? If it's about defining their identity, it's a, if it's about exploring their power, exploring their interactions with others, but even just the most basic things of understanding the resources within those communities, it's something that we really need to understand. Next slide. So it's a slow process but the decolonialization of mapping has begun. Uh, last week, I watched an incredible webinar about the decolonialization of maps. And one of the resources they talked about was the Palestinian Open Map Project in which they juxtaposed Israeli and Palestinian historical maps and then moved them forward to show you the destruction of Palestinian communities and the superimposition of Israeli settlements. And this was like an this is an incredible way in which a community can experience history, have kind of a, a validation of their grief and their experiences, and then also kind of understand what needs to happen in order to move forward. We're seeing this in many different avenues. We're seeing it um, through a lot of the open source mapping options that are being utilized, let's say, for example, by African-American communities in the United States where they look at racial terror lynchings. And we're also seeing this a little bit more in the humanitarian space in which people are identifying underrepresented or under-centered voices and are actively pulling them into the conversation to glean the things that they need and understand their environment in order to create better programming. Next slide. So why is this important in humanitarian maps? Well, let's start off with humanitarian spaces are resource restrained, time limited, high stakes environments. And maps are increasingly being used to understand risks, contexts, who are vulnerable and what are the resources available. And so the deep interrogation of who is creating these maps and what are the biases around these maps is tremendously important, not only for us to understand the true context, to understand who is truly vulnerable and why they're truly vulnerable, but also to have effective, impactful, and ethical information dissemination and resource allocation. 
So again, I'm gonna pause one more time and see if there are any comments. So still, no, still nowadays road signs show Israeli settlements but disregard Palestinian villages. Yes, entirely true. This is not just a historical kind of example. The representation of Israel-Palestine remains problematic. You can't use Google Maps because it is, uh, it, it does in fact overrepresent Israeli settlements and infrastructure. So there are growing mechanisms that Palestinian communities are using to openly map their spaces and environments. So like Map Me exists and I used it when I was in Ramallah and the West Bank in Gaza. And it's, it's one of those kind of open source mechanisms by which communities that are otherwise disenfranchised are being um, kind of amplified and allowed to create and express their spaces. Let's see what else. Map data sets that rely on connectivity or crowdsource exclude vulnerable populations. Do you think that $12,000 cell phones propagate exclusivity? Uh, I don't have a $12,000 cell phone, <laughs> but yes, obviously they do. I think that that's a, a statement in a question, right? Um, crowdsourcing does not necessarily need to be through a higher level platforms like OSM. They don't necessarily need to have uh, web-based connectivity. I know that there are increasing SMS or dumb phone interfaces that allow people to kind of upload experiences, whether it be of political violence or resources or damage secondary to a climate-based event. I agree completely that uh, crowdsourcing based entirely upon technology availability is problematic. And we need to think through that kind of ICT availability and a rights-based approach to both uh, who is, providing data, how do we triangulate that data, and how do we disseminate important data? All right, ne oh, excuse me, $1,200, not $12,000. I don't have either of those things. <laughs> All right, uh, next slide, please. So with that, I'm going to essentially stop and reflect back on what we talked about. I wanna, really encourage all of you to think about who is defining our world and how will you define our world. I want you to think about like the very minuscule or seemingly minuscule decisions that go into scale, projection, symbols, and analysis, how they change the narrative. And I also want you to think about what is being told and what is being silenced. And lastly, and most importantly, in this very tenuous day, I want you to think about who has the power to speak and how they're representing our reality, who doesn't have the power to speak, who is being underrepresented, who is being oppressed, and what we're gonna do about it. And with that, I'm gonna move on to the next slide and say thank you to everybody. Uh, again, my name is Erica Nelson. I'm from the Hum Geo program. I very tongue in cheek wanna say we respect your boundaries. But again, I welcome this as a conversation and I'll pause for a few minutes to see if there's anything else that we wanna talk about together. Nothing coming up. I'm gonna stick around for a little while. My Twitter handle and my email is gonna be placed again in the comments section. Um, I just wanna put a shout out out there for next Thursday at 11 o'clock, same bat time, same bat place. We're gonna be talking about remote sensing and conflict. It's gonna be a discussion around imagery analysis for conflict forensics and mass atrocity early warning. It'll be with the illustrious Syra Khan, intelligent Caitlin Howarth and the elusive Isaac Baker. It's gonna be incredible. I'll be there. Hopefully we'll, you will too. And then lastly, uh, this is a precursor for our longer course in January. Go to the HHI website, it'll be on there for uh, kind of signing up for the listserv to get you more information as registration comes nearer. All right, thank you everybody.